On the Champs-Élysées, one of Paris's most symbolic uh, avenues, with some 5,000 troops parading, in addition to tens of jet fighters, planes, helicopters. And this year, there'll be uh, three Rafale from India. And uh, three of those uh, planes uh, that uh, India has been uh, purchasing will be flying over Paris uh, carrying the Indian flag. And just as well, because India is France's guest of honor to celebrate uh, 25 years of uh, strategic partnerships between the two countries. The partnership includes five pillars, including defense. So while inviting Prime Minister Narendra Modi to France uh, for his uh, very special visits, President Emmanuel Macron stressed that France and India share a similar vision on peace and security, especially in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific region. And they stand for the goals and principles of the United Nations chart. Over the past decades, several countries have been invited as guests of honors to the uh, so-called Bastille Day, including Brazil, one of the BRICS countries, another BRICS country, I should say. Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and the United States, they've all been taking part uh, through their heads of states or governments, and also through a presence, a military presence. But this year, as I said, is a very special year because there's just so much going on between India and France. But also this visit is taking place following Prime Minister Modi's visit to the United States and somewhat uh, um, extended uh, role uh, as a world leader. And for me to discuss this, I have two outstanding colleagues uh, who are going to uh, discuss uh, the uh, current uh, state of Franco-Indian relations, but also um, India's role as a world power. First, I have uh, my colleague, Fawa Amir, who is the director of South Asia Initiatives at the Asia Society Policy Institute, ASPI, uh, in New York, where she oversees the Institute's policy work and projects in South Asia. Prior to ASPI, Fawa worked at the Stimson Center, where she led research on the security, political, and social economic dimensions of transboundary river governance in the Himalayan region. Next is a friend of Asia Society France, Dr. Mohit Anand, who has over 16 years of experience in industry and academia, and who is currently an associate professor at EM Lyon Business School um, in Lyon, and who has been living in France on and off for almost two decades, I'm told. And Mohit uh, has a lot of experience in teaching in France, and but also in India, and received his uh, PhD at EM Lyon and an MBA at another uh, French business school at, in Reims. And before joining EM Lyon, he was an associate professor at Four School of Management in New Delhi. So uh, before, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, before going into the uh, discussion, perhaps I could ask first um, uh, Mohit um, to walk us through the, um, the, the visits, and uh, he's been writing about it in the Sunday Guardian in India and in various publications, and he obviously follows very closely relations between the two countries. Um, I'd like to ask you first, um, how, how you would characterize the ties between India and, and, and France, and how important you feel this visit is going to be. Uh, thank you, Philip. Hello, Farah. Good to be here. Uh, I think uh, in one way, if I can um, um, encapsulate to start with uh, this uh, topic is that um, the, the relation between India and France is a very good template of East and West model of cooperation. Um, and as you mentioned, there are various pillars of cooperation, uh, which goes from the early times of 
France being a colonizer to now being a strategic partner. So it has come a long way in a relationship which was more top down to a more equilibrium uh, in various geopolitical architectures where India and France tries to collaborate. Of course, having said that, uh, the dynamism of relationship really picked up uh, I would say 20 to 30 years after India's independence, where up until then the relationship was mostly aid programs or technological um, inputs from France or some sort of uh, defense trade, when in particularly the, um, uh, the 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 Mirage aircrafts. The relationship really picked up, uh, uh, you know, in the late uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, during the presidency of uh, Jack Chirac. Um, he was very charismatic as a leader who really catapulted India's uh, relationship with France and vice versa, and uh, really brought in more acknowledgement of India's rights uh, uh, you know, in the world that probably the West, other Western countries, US and UK, would shy away from acknowledging. Uh, and there are examples for that. For example, in 19... 19- 70s when India conducted nuclear tests, uh, US and uh, Western countries denied nuclear technology and fuel for its Tarapur nuclear plant. And it was France that came to the rescue of India's uh, much needed electricity and power demand. Uh, And the same was repeated in 1990s when India did another series of nuclear tests uh, with the exception of just France, Russia, and Israel, other countries put sanctions. So I think India has seen over the years that, um, and I would say that very openly and, and without any candidness, that probably after Russia, uh, a country that India would probably have a very good and a deeper level of mutual trust would be France. Um, you know, And that that has been one of the cornerstones of relationship that India and France have developed. And that has fostered after uh, signing of India's first strategic partnership with any country, uh, which started with France. Uh, you know, India was India. India chose France as the first country to have strategic partnership, and as of now, we have thirty. Right. So that tells you the importance of that relationship to begin with. So in. T- in terms of the, the, the strategic partnership, of course, there are, uh, I think, five pillars, including uh, space technology, uh, defense, nuclear, counterterrorism, the economy. But it seems to me that uh, on the technology and economic sides, uh, which is your specialty, um, perhaps the Indian investment to France has been somewhat uh, limited over the past few years. So. Do you expect this visit by uh, Prime Minister Modi to finally uh, drive uh, perhaps Indian companies into into the French market, into which is also a door to the EU market? As you know, it's not just uh, um, it's not just France. Uh, especially, we are now talking a, of a post Brexit EU, which means, of course, the relationship between the the uh, United Kingdom and India being being quite special, uh, that sort of opens the door for a different type of relationship between the EU and and India. Absolutely, I totally agree. I think a large part of uh, economic and um, foreign investment has been more lopsided with France doing the favor to India than the other way around. Although to be fair, India does more export to France than France does to India. So India has more trade balance in its favor, while France has more foreign direct investment balance in its favor towards India. Just to give you a comparison, there are roughly 150 Indian companies in France, while you have 38 out of the 35 out of the top 40 Cacaronth French companies in India and roughly 1,000 French companies. So I totally agree. And I think if you compare uh, our, our, the potential of economic and trade partnership, it's limitless. But it, as of now, it's it's very limited, even compared to countries like uh, Germany and Netherlands, which has a bigger trade, or even Italy to some extent. I think uh, that's what is going to be on an agenda, how to make uh, uh, France as one of the key gateways uh, to its business, uh, Indian business in Europe, and also probably with the Brexit and its consequences, uh, France also would have to do its part to attract 
Indian companies moving away from England to come to France and let's say not going to Germany or Switzerland or other European mainland countries. I think the problems are related to ease of doing issues, taxes, regulations, language, uh, and others. Um, but I think that can be overcome. This is where I think the, uh, the joint working group and mechanisms are already set up, but I think they need to be more proactive. And COVID has certainly not been helpful uh, in increasing the, the trade and investment. But I think recently, as you saw with the aviation uh, order that Air India and Air Indigo India's two largest airlines, it's the biggest order, 750 aircrafts given to Airbus. So also it is expected that, um, you know, other companies also uh, follow suit, you know, and uh, I think that's where both have to work. But I would say, again, uh, uh, if you look at other areas like culture, tourism, it has increased. Uh, education is one area where certainly, which is my domain. So just to give you an idea, um, I was part of the India-France Knowledge Summit a few years back, and we had an, uh, a target of having... 10,000 students coming from India to France by 2020. We already achieved that in 2019. And we are going to double the number by 2025 to have 20,000 Indian students. So I think uh, there are various other vari areas in which um, Indian investments, Indian interests in France particularly uh, can be looked into. Uh, one can be pharmaceutical, um, uh, technology, um, and areas like uh, fintech, um, uh, artificial intelligence, on climate finance, these are other areas where I think Indian and French companies can collaborate and, and work forward. Excellent. Well, let me turn to, to, to Fawa now, uh, moving into the sort of more strategic domain. But I'm really interested in your view uh, you're sitting in New York, and obviously uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi also visited the United States very recently. This was a, a high-profile uh, visit. I'm wondering what the how you see the impact of that visit uh, to to the U.S. and 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 if, is there any connection between the U.S. visits and the Europe uh, visit in, in terms of um, the impact on on uh, of, of India's um, global, uh, rising global uh, stature, you could say. Uh, thank you so much, Philippe. And it's great to be here um, along with uh, Mohit uh, to be speaking about this very important event that's coming up this week. You know, India, which is now the most populous country in the world, has seen its influence increase significantly in recent years. You know, we, Mohit just talked about it. It's robust economic growth, digital economy, favorable demographics, all kind of make it an attractive partner for investors uh, and international players. Plus, through the various minilaterals, you know, India is strengthening its relationship with the West as well as uh, with the Middle East. Uh, it's hosting the G20 presidency this year with the summit coming up in the fall. Prime Minister Modi was uh, also at the G7 uh, summit in May. Uh, he just wrapped up hosting the um, SCO summit. So hits and misses aside, you know, India um, throughout its international engagements has shown its commitment in solidifying its position as a key player in shaping global agendas and addressing pressing global challenges. You know, most recently, um, the Inter-Pacific Coordinator of U.S. National Security Council, Kurt Campbell, praised India, citing that the country has become the most sought-after player on the global stage which uh, brings us to the U.S. state visit uh, that you mentioned, Philippe. I was there at the Prime Minister Modi's address in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and you could just see how well received he was by the American business community, the Indian diaspora, and just Washington in general rolled out the red carpet for him. The announcements in technology and defense cooperation uh, kind of speak volumes of the strengthening bilateral relationship between the two, whether it's a GE F414 deal or the purchase of the Sea Guardian drones. These are all shining examples of the impact of the visit and the deepening defense collaboration between the two countries. And it doesn't stop there. You know, from the announcements and agreements, uh, we can see that the U.S.-India collaboration now extends far beyond. You know, we're looking at uh, joint space exploration, technological advancements and economic cooperation. The only thing now remains to be seen is how well will these materialize and how fast will these be implemented? 
Also, while this visit wasn't exclusively centered on China, um, the joint statement uh, sends a message that both nations, uh, the United States and India, are cautioned against rising tensions and destabilizing actions in the East and South China Sea. Now, to that end, it's interesting how this is all kind of coming together, because uh, even President Biden has hosted three official state visits during his tenure so far, and uh, one's uh, one has been in Prime Minister Modi, and before that was President Macron. So you know, there is obviously that interconnectedness in that regard as well. But um, with Prime Minister Modi's upcoming visit to France as a guest of honor holds great significance as France has been a vital partner for India, as, as Mohit rightly pointed out. You know, this invitation reflects the efforts of both France and India to enhance their cooperation, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, defense, security, and technology sectors. You know, significant contracts, um, and agreements are sort of anticipated, such as the procurement of the Rafale um, M planes for the Navy, and also with regards to the joint development of fighter jet engines. But we'll see how the visit um, transpires. There are a lot of meetings, a lot of engagements with French politicians that are also expected while Prime Minister Modi is there. Also, not to forget that this visit to France is happening against that backdrop of a broader expansion of relations between Europe and India particularly in the trade and technology sectors. So, you know, we, we might have this week opening up new chapters of cooperation and reinforcing the already outstanding sort of political coordination between France and India. Thank you. Yeah, it's very symbolic, obviously, having uh, Indian Rafales flying over uh, Paris uh, on, on, on July the 14th. But as you know, we're also facing a, a war in, 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 in Europe and the Ukraine question is critical in, in today's geopolitics. Uh, so uh, whoever comes to Europe is, will have to be asked uh, the question is, what is the standing of your government uh, with regard to the invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia? And obviously, Russia, as India, is a member of the so-called BRICS. Um, so are Brazil, and I referred to earlier, and um, and uh, China and, and South, South Africa. I'm just wondering, uh, from this point of view, there have been many discussions about India's um, uh, role, possible role, or at least, you know, uh, public opinion on on uh, on this war, and which, of course, Europeans are very keen to see ending uh, sooner rather than later. Um, what is the discussion at the moment in, in in New Delhi on this matter? I'd like to ask both of you, perhaps, to 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 make a few comments on this. Shall we start with with you, Mohit, and then and then we'll come back to Fawa. Sure. I mean, yeah, of course, there is this uh, Ukraine factor that will be um, that will be discussed for sure. Maybe not as explicitly as the Western media or the world would want, but implicitly, of course. And there are two or three factors in it, which is um, are going to be discussed. One is what is India's stand? What is India's contribution in de-escalating um, uh, the situation? Uh, and how India and other developing countries, um, you know, try to overcome uh, the, the vagaries of the Ukraine conflict that is the world is seeing, be it uh, inflation, supply chain disruptions, etc. So, of course, this will be discussed. But at the same time, I feel that uh, since it is entering 500 days plus of the war, there is a sense of fatigue that has come up. How many times will you discuss that? But it will be discussed. Um, what I feel is that the, France and in general, but also particularly the Western world in a very broader level, understands India's compulsions of not taking a very uh, black or white stand on the conflict. India is having different shades of gray on that. On one side, India has condemned the war, but not condemned Russia. Uh, India is trying back channel talks, um, but to what extent it would be successful, it needs to be seen. But I think there is a sense of acceptance, if not complete understanding of India's stand on Ukraine, where India on one hand condemns the war, uh, but at the same time tries to get, like China, some advantage out of it, whether it's cheap oil or better bargain, better overflying rights, which makes India's um, you know, position uh, a, a little bit better than other countries in the region. 
but it's a tricky situation that the West knows that India cannot outrightly condemn Russia for obviously strategic defense and historical reasons. I mean, uh, Russia was there to scratch the back of India when India needed someone's help, uh, uh, when no other country was there. So I think that would be an understanding uh, that by Condemning India, it won't get anything, but engaging India with the dialogue to find a way out uh, would be rather more helpful, I think. And Fawa, how was the Ukraine question answered to by, by uh, Mr. Modi when he visited Washington? Yeah, so, you know, it's very important to understand that India throughout uh, its in entire political career uh, has maintained strategic autonomy as, as something that it champions. You know, it, it, it allows for the country to be able to have bilateral engagements without any external influence, kind of dictating how India operates or sees its national interests. For India, it's very important to put, um, in, you know, with regards to its relationships, whether it's with Russia, which is time and tested, and as, as uh, Minister of External Affairs, as uh, S.J. Shankar was there with Sergei Lavrov last year, they stood together and he said, you know, the relationship, it's steady and it's time and tested with Russia. And this is happening at a time when, of course, the Ukraine conf conflict is um, right at the top of the you know, priority, even though, as, as Mohit said, that there might be some fatigue involved, but it, you know, the conflict is there, the war is still there, and there's a lot of um, uh, Western sentiments around it, even when here in the United States. I think it's very important to understand and reiterate that Because India's growing um, prowess, international on the global stage, on the uh, regional stage, and for it to become the kind of important strategic partner that has become for its for these different countries, whether it's the United States, whether it's France, whether it's Russia, um, at least uh, for much of the West, and like I'll speak for the United States when Prime Minister Modi was here, that they've learned to manage these differences. They've understood, they respect India's decision, they respect India's you know, time-tested history with Russia. Um, and the idea that Prime Minister Modi keeps on uh, reiterating in all of his international engagements with regards to the Ukraine conflict is that dialogue and diplomacy is the way to forward for peace in the region. Uh, that's how India supports it. That's how India will be taking it forward. And the stance has not changed ever since the beginning of the conflict. And it's likely to remain so going forward as well, uh, knowing that it's likely that Prime Minister Modi's administration will continue in the next election cycle as well. And with uh, United States also, you know, there's, there's benefit. And uh, Mohit mentioned the, the purchase of crude oil. You know, India could purchase the crude oil, refine it, and it's available cheaply to the West through India. So, you know, the West doesn't have to directly get itself involved um, with Russia to, to procure that oil, and it can come through India. So these are like many benefits to have that channel of India still um, sort of sustained with Russia uh, for the West as well. So there are a lot of factors uh, in with that regard involved, but India um, is a very pragmatic as to its approach with um, China as well. It, in, it, it's made it clear that whatever bilateral relationship will have will depend on uh, whether there's peace at the borders or not. Uh, but it doesn't take a very hard or hard-hitting stance overtly so much unless there is some sort of trigger or provocation against India's own national interests or there is a border conflict. Likewise, with Russia, we're not going to see a hard stance. Um, we are going to see that push for dialogue and diplomacy, even if uh, there are conversations with regards to that happening during this upcoming visit, similarly as it was with the visit here in the United States. So there have been a flow of visits, uh, uh, you know, uh, between capitals and uh, President Macron was not only in Washington, uh, as you, as uh, Mohit said earlier, but also uh, visited to China and, uh, and European leaders, you know, keep repeating to China that, um, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, neutrality should be uh, perhaps uh, um, um, turned into uh, positive gestures and, and, and for the Europeans, especially if, if, if China is interested in the, in the European markets. It is, uh, apparently, um, and so is India. So I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether um, India could go a little bit further than just you know, uh, calling for discussion and dialogue uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 you know, picking up the phone or, 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 or visiting Moscow or, or, or doing something just beyond that pure diplomacy, which is obviously not working very well as far as uh, it, 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 uh, you can tell from, from, from you know, Europe now at the moment. We, we are now, you know, it's been a year and a half and obviously, um, um, you know, uh, 
it, it's led to many problems, economic, some of them um, uh, Mohit mentioned earlier. Uh, but we really need to speed up the process because I think Europeans are, are getting war fatigue. And in fact, you know, in other continents as well. Mohit, do you want to? Do you want to? Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, sorry. I'll, I totally agree. I mean, of course, um, as what Farwa said, you know, uh, the visit of uh, Prime Minister Modi to US had a landmark G deal with GE Aerospace. But the devil is in the detail, you know, and will that lead to an execution or rather sort of walk the talk? We'll see. Um, but insofar as the China factor is concerned, yes, uh, and, and Russia, I mean, India can try, but I often say that uh, that India cannot and should not punch above its economic weight. I mean, China has a huge economic power uh, on purchasing power is the world leading economy. India is third. Uh, so India needs to address the diplomatic issues insofar as in line with its what we call as the punch shield policy, which is a five virtue policy that India should not and may not interfere in other countries' affairs. Of course, this is a regional and a global conflict that is happening. So India has to play this card very delicately, like a balancing of a tight rope walk, you know, uh, how much can it press Russia, which it is trying to probably at the back channels. But I think openly, unlike China, where Xi Jinping had a meeting and have a five point agenda or a 13 point agenda, um, India may not be able to do that because it has its own other diplomatic and political issues in its neighborhood, whether it's Sri Lanka, Pakistan, China, and others. So I think India already have too much on its plate with this, particularly with the Galwan clash in China. I think so. India do not want to, for a lack of better word, use or waste its energy on areas where probably its its effectiveness and anchoring of its diplomacy may not lead to a greater result. But definitely, I I, I do feel with a very proactive foreign policy led by Jay Shankar, a foreign minister, there are some back channel talks, uh, and probably it might come through the G20 or some other forums, although they are not a security forum, so they may not be discussed again explicitly, but implicitly. So yeah, it, it has its own limitations. Similarly, I think India is also using Russia as an anchor to uh, to leverage India, Indo-Russian relation to mediate, in a sense, with China's conflict. You know, it's a, uh, so I think uh, India is also aware of that, that how much you can push Russia to uh, move away from the conflict, right? India and China are doing exactly the same in a in a less subdued manner. But so yeah, it's challenging, and I feel it's from my perspective, inside out, it's the right strategy. You know, you cannot pressurize your long tested ally and an all weather friend, uh, particularly when it stood up for you. So I think it's it's a tricky situation. But so far, India has managed to balance. The, the compulsions with Russia and its expectations from the West. My only worry is uh, if the war goes on and some other dynamics come into, maybe NATO or European influence, uh, what will be Russia India's position? It might have to take a stand uh, and a posturing sooner or later. So um, then it would be an issue. Power, can I can I ask you about other uh, global issues and and India's role and the, the role it wants to play? I'm thinking of um, international responsible finance. We just had a, a meeting in Paris, and I don't believe uh, the the prime minister was there, but but he was uh, certainly represented at, at cabinet level. Uh, I'm thinking of climate, obviously the, the Paris um, uh, climate accord that, that was signed by India and, and by almost the, the whole world community. And of course, uh, there are still many questions being asked about, uh, about the carbon emissions and the, 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 the outcome. I know you've been following this issue. So I'd like to hear you about you know, other issues besides the defense, which, is, which will, of course, be at the heart of, 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 of July, uh, the July 13th and 14th visit. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, just to build on what also Moit was talking about, and I think it kind of segs into you know what your question as well, Philippe, uh, is that India has maintained a very um, 
good stance in terms of staying away from divisive politics. It's been one of the key aspects of the G20 presidency as well. And um, the the whole idea is how do you well navigate the whole geopolitical landscape that India has found itself in. And so far, the, the foreign policy is kind of working in, in its own benefit and also in the benefit of its partners. So there's much to be seen. Of course, with things coming up, there's never ending cycle of evolving um political security concerns in the world that we live in. But uh, certainly, I mean, for India, the imperative to combat climate change and fostering sustainable development has become an increasingly important priority, both domestically and within its international engagements. At COP26, India had announced its goal of reaching net zero by 2070, and climate change and SDGs have been important aspects of this G20 presidency, like we talked about. You know, India wants to be the voice of the global south for the West, and climate is a key aspect of that. So in terms of working with partner countries and in this context, let's talk about France. You know, there has been an ongoing alignment between India and France with regards to climate change mitigation. There are joint efforts uh, such as the International Solar Solar Alliance and the Indo-Pacific Box Partnership kind of highlight the collaborative approach taken by these two countries to promote sustainable practices and conservation. In India and France have also agreed to explore opportunities to jointly work on just energy transition pathways and under G7 to accelerate deployment of renewables. Um, the two are also cooperating with the United Arab Emirates um, uh, to promote solar and nuclear energy, as well as in the fight against climate change and the protection of biodiversity, particularly in the Indian Ocean region. So. These are all kind of um, you know areas and initiatives where you see the two countries coming together with a lot of commitment and a lot of fervor. Uh, India all, also invited France to participate in its initiative to make India a green hydrogen hub uh, under its uh, national hydrogen mission. You know, the two countries also have a roadmap on hydrogen and there may just be progress uh, with, with regard to that roadmap during this visit. So one of the other areas to watch out will be this. Um, but apart from climate change, you know, if you look at um, other key cooperation areas between these two countries, which is developing and progressing, it's people to people ties. You know, they, there's, developing strongly, especially on the education work front, and Mohit kind of indicated that initially in his response. You know, the French envoy to India, Ambassador um, Emmanuel Lenon, um, speaking of the visit, shared that uh, France wants to develop easier pathways for Indians to come work and study in, in, the, in France, and there could be potential announcements in that regard. Too. And I'm, I'm happy to hear the kind of stats that Moed had shared in terms of the education exchange that's taking place between the two countries. And one of the factors is multilateralism. You know, that has been an important shared value between the EU and um, India, whether it's a common goal of helping to preserve a rule-based world order or the need to modernize the United Nations or preserving multilateralism in, um, say, rapidly changing global circumstances, in this visit um, will surely provide an opportunity for both India and France to reaffirm their commitment to multilateralism, including in the context of India's C20 presidency. Now, through the bilateral meetings and the engagements of late between the two countries that you know we've been observing and have been um, closely looking at, you know, both countries have repeatedly conveyed their vision to strengthen the ongoing cooperation at the multilateral platform on issues of mutual interest, which of course includes you know, counterterrorism and other areas. Um, so there's a lot of um, collaboration there that you will see and hopefully you know, we'll see more of. Um, the world needs uh, important players in the global space to come together for a sustainable, better future for all, a sort of a mindset. Um, and also, you know, France supports uh, India's bid for the UN Security Council. So the two, the two sides are certainly hoping that the visit is leveraged and makes a meaningful impact in a way that it's a win-win for, for both countries. And, uh, you know, just like the visit in the United States, you know, we, we'll, we'll see announcements, we'll see declarations, see agreements, uh, but we'll also have to wait and see how well um, they will be executed and how meaningfully will they be um, materialized uh, that will actually pave the way forward for how the U.S., um, for, sorry, the India-France strategic partnership is going to look like um, as, as the next chapter begins. Right, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask both of you to, to name three um, 
potential successful outcomes for this visit. One for India, one for France, and one for the world. Shall we start with Mohit? Yeah, why not? Um, within one for France, I would say more purchase of Rafael. Uh, <laughs> the, the talk of 26 more Rafael to be bought, which has been declared in the press, uh, and possibility of technology transfer for three nuclear submarine technology over and above uh, France authorizing 100% uh, technology transfer as opposed to U.S. GE providing 80% technology transfer. And by the way, this approval came just days after US, uh, uh, India and US signed the deal. So you can see how, how reactive and proactive French are uh, tapping into this vast uh, Indian military uh, overseas shopping that India is going to do. Uh, partly we can thank the neighborhood. Uh, so, so I think in that sense, for France, the win-win the is in terms of um, its defense industry is getting a bump up. Uh, and India buying defense means a lot of confidence for its in machinery and technology and engine for other countries. Like last when India bought last time, UAE and Indonesia went ahead and bought Rafale. So I think that's there. For India, I think India would seek a win-win in terms of greater technology uh, from France. Uh, be it in, um, um, you know, uh, uh, renewable energies, uh, uh, you know, in, in defense, in uh, space exploration. So India and France, India will actually benefit from that. And, and, and the reason is that France has skills, India has skill. So India can use the skills and to scale up the technology that France can provide. Um, so that would be a win-win for India. And I think the other win-win for India is a greater access to French market, thanks to ongoing negotiations of India-Europe free trade agreement. By the way, these negotiations uh, restarted when France was the presidency, holded the presidency of EU last year from January to June, 2022. So it was during that tenure that India and Europe started renegotiation of free trade agreement. So that's a win-win for India. A win-win for the globe as rising middle powers. Um, you have US on the West and rise of China on the East and India and France are somewhere in between as middle powers in Asia and Europe respectively. I think there is a lot of collaboration that can happen in terms of, as what Farva said, uh, you know, climate change, solar alliance, global South financing, debt crisis in the developing world, as well as on sustainability and other areas. So I think that could be an outcome from uh, from the global perspective. Rest, we will have to wait to see what comes out of the dinner between President Macro and Prime Minister at Louvre on the 14th. Right, food is always very important, but hopefully <laughs> there'll be more than, than a good dinner. Uh, Fawa, how do you see potential successful outcomes for this visit in, in, in for I mean, India, I, I France and the world? I, I have to second uh, what Moit said for France uh, in, in in terms of that, that is something that's of course going to be huge, and the reaction um, that has come with regards to how competitive the global market has become in terms of in, investing in India also is is a, a kind of like validating India's status as an important global player that all of these countries want to work with India. Um, for uh, India itself, I think that there are two things. One, uh, one which is kind of a given, you know, there's uh, uh, the elevation in its global visibility and its global stature and being honored by President Biden and being honored by President Macron. And th these are important aspects for um, a country that, you know, is, going, is, is aiming to be the voice of the global south, to be getting there and to be um, bridging that east and the west gap and uh, bridging the gap between Europe and the region as well. So that is one. And the other is, of course, India is looking to you know, build its defense cap capabilities and capacities so much so that it doesn't have to rely on any other country. It becomes an independently uh, important and kind of self-reliant in terms of its defense capacity as well. So uh, with this deal sort of... Um, materializing, you know, that adds another feather in the cap in terms of the defense sector uh, for, for India. So that's going to be another boon. And Indians uh, with that 1.4 billion and growing population uh, would need those avenues to be to be able to travel abroad, to be able to study abroad, to be able to work abroad. And, you know, here in the United States, you, you saw some movement with regards to the work visas. Uh, there, there's an easing up for, for the Indians. And likely if there's any announcement with regards to a similar sort of uh, a commitment from France as well, 
well, you will see that uh, exchange of skill um, and exchange of that you know work uh, flow between these two countries and education knowledge sharing, which is all, which are uh, very important aspects of globalization, which we had kind of missed during the world becoming a little bit more polarized over the last few years. For the world, again, you know, this is a good example of how you come together as countries and you, you want to see more of that. You want to see more of, um, you know, cohesive collective action developing uh, between um, countries that have the capacity and the capability to ensure a better and sustainable future for all, whether it's in terms of um, security in general or in terms of, um, you know, climate change and other important areas that are, are, are now a, a equally important security concerns, even if you, you know, some may not like the tag of security attached to climate change. These are pertinent concerns and they are important areas to come together on. So if uh, there is more movement on, say, acceleration of renewal, renewables uh, deployment, there's more movement in terms of how climate finance is becoming accessible, you know, money flowing from the from the more powerful, from wealthier economies to countries here in the global south that much more needed, are vulnerable to climate change, are vulnerable to other uh, such issue areas, we will see a, a little bit um, more um, sort of fast-paced movement towards the whole uh, climate goal that we have at 1.5 degrees, uh, which is a little bit stagnant and uh, we'll and on multilateralism as well, you'll see a little bit more collective or sort of like like-minded thinking um, on multilateral forums as well, which might also move agendas that have been stuck for a while. Great, thank you. Well, I think multilateralism is really uh, the key word of uh, what I what I uh, hear from both of you today. Uh, especially, you could could expect l no less from the India that is chairing the, from the country that is chairing the G20 this year. But also, France has been a proponent of multilateralism for for quite some time as as a permanent member of the Security Council and uh, a pretty active uh, player in the Indo-Pacific uh, region as well, militarily, economically, and even through its uh, uh, close to 2 million uh, French residents in the, the whole region. So with this, I have to thank you very much. Both of you have, have, have contributed a great deal to the, to the debates. Uh, to the to to the explaining what this visit is about the Franco-Indian relationship and also uh, the new status that that uh, uh, Modi's India is uh, is uh, achieving perhaps through these visits but also also more diplomatic um, initiatives. So I'll, I'll, I'll refer uh, our audience to uh, the ASPI, the Asia Society Policy Institute's website, which you are more than welcome to. To, to, to check and uh, all our reports. And also uh, uh, Professor Mohit uh, announced um, um, various articles and, and, and papers that you, they can find easily online through his um, webpage. Uh, but with this, I will, uh, I will call it today and, uh, and thank both of you for your great contribution. And hopefully I'll see you soon for our next uh, conversation. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Philippe. Thanks Thank for our pleasure meeting you. Much.